Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our inaugural basic pneumatics webinar here. Um, we are recording this in case anyone missed that. We just started. Uh, so if you don't want to be on the recording, uh, you can drop off now, but we certainly invite you to stay. Uh, as I said, this is our inaugural offering of this webinar. Uh, E&M picked up the Festo line about two years ago, at about around November of 2020. Uh, so this has been kind of a new product for us. It's really been exciting for us to, to get to know pneumatics. You know, we've been most of us here at ENM have been involved in automation in one form or another for an awful long time. Uh, I myself have been in the automation industry for over 20 years. And, you know, most of us on the electrical side. So pneumatics has been kind of new to us. Um, I kind of, in my head, joke about this is, is not so much a basic of pneumatics as pneumatics for dummies by a dummy because I, I was brand new to this a couple of years ago. I certainly do not consider myself an expert. Uh, fortunately, we do have a couple of Festo representatives on with us, uh, but this is not a, a Festo specific offering that we're gonna go into today. Uh, and you know, I know in signing up for this, some of you people put that you had a pretty good uh, background in pneumatics. And uh, I'm probably not going to tell you guys anything you don't know, but I would certainly welcome your feedback at the end of this class. We will be sending out a survey and because this is kind of new uh, presentation for us, I, I definitely, because I came up with this presentation, would uh, welcome all your guys' feedback at the end to try and say, hey, yes, this was useful, or this is, you know, for our new employees, this is definitely something I'd like them to see, you know, things like that. That's the kind of feedback we're looking for there. And uh, with that, let's kind of jump into things here. Uh, so what is pneumatic? Uh, pneumatics, pneumatic power. Uh, you know, it's it originated with the Greek word pneuma, uh, and basically pneumatics is a fluid power. Uh, we, th we think of air and how it reacts in a system as a fluid. Uh, so what's a fluid? It, it's, you know, something that we use uh, with pressure to perform work, or, you know, in the case of water, you know, you create that energy by raising it and letting it flow over something. Uh, Wind can kind of do the same thing by pressurizing it is what water can flying over we flowing over a wheel. Uh, you know, wind is a form of pressure, uh, but we also can put it into tanks and, and pump it into tanks and create that pressure differential between the tank and free atmosphere. And that way we can let that air do work for us. A couple of terms when we talk about fluid power is force and speed. And so they, have very different meanings. Uh, they are related. Uh, so force is determined by the amount of pressure that we're exerting and that pressure, uh, not just the amount of pressure, but the area that that pressure is acting on. Um, speed is determined by the air flow. Um, you know, we'll go into that just a little bit more, but first I kind of want to show you a short little video. Uh, there's no sound to this, so don't worry if, if you're seeing the video and not the sound, I'll be kind of speaking over it a little bit. Uh, but I want you to, when you're watching this, uh, think about these things and how, you know, if most of you are like me, where you have that electrical background, uh, you know, kind of think in your head, okay, this is what I would do electrically, but know that most everything on this line that I'm going to show you uh, is done using pneumatics or air pressure. Uh, so they're going to kind of show you uh, essentially a packaging machine here. And uh, as we go down the line, you're going to see a lot of different things. Most everything on this line is pneumatic. So even the robots, you've got grippers on the arms, you know, you're picking things up, you're moving them from one location to another. Uh, all these things are something that we can do with pneumatic power instead of electrical power. And depending on your environment, what you're trying to do, there are uh, benefits to either one. And at the end of the presentation here, we'll kind of go over just a short list of some of the pros and cons of using uh, pneumatics versus electrical options. But here we see, you know, we're using uh, suction, uh, so a form of vacuum to place the cardboard box, you know, on the line and the, the orientation we want it. Uh, we're using uh, different types of actuators as we move down the line to put everything in place. You know, so simple motion, you know, two, two position motion is very easy with pneumatics. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some multi position motion that we can do as well. Uh, your conveyors on this line obviously are probably electric. Uh, you could use pneumatic motors for something like that as well, uh, depending on 
the type of power you need and, and which is more uh, beneficial. But we do use electricity to create our pressurized air typically. So some things don't lend themselves quite as well to pneumatics. Uh, but you can see here a uh, pick and place type stuff where it's you know very specific locations that we're going back and forth from. Pneumatics is a great option for that. As we go down the line here, you know, you just see everything that's kind of creating motion in here in these machines is pneumatic. You know, we're, we're pushing in our, our cardboard tops using actuators and we're moving it down the rail and, and they fold in uh, just using simple rods, right? But then everything else that we see operating here is using pneumatic air pressure. We're grabbing it, picking up, putting in the box, box moves down the line. We get into uh, you know, the final packaging where we're putting it on crate on crates, you know, to be able to ship. Um, and again, you see here we're using a vacuum pressure. Uh, vacuum can be created a, a number of different ways. It is a form of fluid pressure that we're using there. Uh, we can use vacuum compressors or we can also or vacuum pumps, I guess, is probably the proper terminology. Uh, or we can use what's called the Bernoulli principle. Uh, which is to flow the air across the surface and, and it actually creates that suction for us. Uh, so a lot of different things here that you see as it goes down the line and it, really that's what we kind of want to do with this presentation today is to give you guys uh, thoughts for where air, air pressure, uh, air tools, pneumatics in general might be a good fit for your, uh, your process, whether it's a machine you're developing, whether it's in your plant, things that you're currently doing electrically that maybe uh, you're having some difficulties with the electrical uh, for one reason or another, it's not a good fit. Uh, you know, there are some advantages to air in the right applications. So as we're moving air from one place to another, that, you know, that's our air flow. Uh, what causes air flow? Typically a differential in air pressure. Uh, so we're talking about a, a tank probably that's holding our air is going to be a higher pressure than atmosphere. And so when we open uh, a line up to atmosphere, that creates that air flow that allows us to do that work uh, when we need flow or when we're just putting that air from the tank into a cylinder or into an actuator uh, to create motion for us. And, uh, and when we equalize that air pressure, so when we're putting it into a, a actuator, you know, once the air pressure in that actuator equals what's in our source, the tank, we don't have any more flow, hence our motion stops. Uh, so we always are flowing from that higher pressure to a low pressure. And, and then you see here, uh, once we get to a 47% differential between those two uh, points, our, our air flow uh, stabilizes, right? So we get a constant flow once we get to that point and it does not become any faster. Uh, so pressure and flow are not the same. Uh, they're not interchangeable. They do different things for us, right? So. Uh, flow gives us more of a speed, whereas the pressure gives us a force. Uh, one thing, you know, when we're designing an air system in a plant or facility or just around a machine, uh, restrictions, so how we pipe it, you know, how many bends we have in our pipe, uh, how many uh, narrowing in that tube, you know, going from one size to another or down into an orifice uh, creates restriction in that flow. And so that that minimizes the amount of flow that we're going to get. And so, the, and there are things with uh, fluid flow, uh, even just with air, uh, there are friction forces that are involved in, in that, especially when you have very long tubing runs. Uh, you know, for those of us uh, more electrical minded, you know, uh, friction equals resistance, right? So the longer your cable runs are, the more power is lost in that run. Same thing applies to pneumatics. Uh, this is just kind of a very basic overview of what a system might entail. Uh, you know, the, obviously very simple slide here, uh, but we have, you know, some sort of air compressor, which is actually the top part of this machine here. Uh, so that takes the air, you know, from the at open atmosphere and it funnels it into this tank that we have here, some sort of holding tank. Uh, and the size of these is going to vary greatly. You might have a small compressor and holding tank for a small machine. Uh, to something that's, you know, literally hundreds of horsepower compressor and maybe uh, a thousand or thousands of uh, gallon size tank, right? Uh, from that air tank, that holding tank, uh, we're going to come out and, and go through a series of what we call um, 
air preparation type of devices. Uh, one of the first ones that we're going to hit is some sort of liquid separator. Uh, as you condense air down into a smaller uh, and smaller area, you know, free air typically does have a lot of things in it that we don't realize. Uh, you know, if, if you have, suffer from allergies like me, uh, you know you can't see a lot of the pollens in the air that set off your allergies, make you sneeze and give watery eyes. It, but we know there's things in the air that are doing this. Same thing in uh, an application like this where we're trying to take that air in. Uh, one of them, the big ones is moisture. There's a lot of moisture in free air. And so first thing we wanna do is kind of filter out that moisture. Uh, there's also a lot of particulates, uh, dust and things like that. Uh, and also uh, quite a bit of oils in the air. Uh, and so we run it through a, a liquid separator and then we've got some filtration items. Uh, we also have a pressure regulator in here. So uh, we might have maybe a, a 200 PSI tank here, but our actual working PSI, we want, you know, pounds per square inch. We want that down maybe around 80 to 90 uh, for a lot of applications. Uh, so we run that through a regulator that only lets that much pressure through into the working part of the line. Uh, so pretty much every system is going to have some sort of air preparation on it. Uh, and probably in multiple locations, you're probably going to have a main, you know, large liquid separator back closer to the tank. Uh, you also might have a cooler on here. Uh, when we compress air, that does tend to create heat. Uh, so a lot of times we need to cool that air as it's going out into our system. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of elements on the front end of the system, but you might also place air prep uh, at a machine level or closer to the actual place that it's doing the work. And that depends a little bit on what you're actually using to do that work. Uh, some devices, certain actuators need a, a cleaner type of air, and that is the amount of filtration that you're doing. Uh, typically, some of the levels that we look at are a 40 micron filtration, 5 micron, and 0.1 micron. Uh, so you can get down to extremely clean air uh, for those clean room type of applications. Uh, chip, you know, chip manufacturing facilities typically need an extremely clean air uh, when they're using air for anything within their facilities. So uh, that's just the amount of filters that you have. And typically you when you need that super ultra clean air, uh, you're gonna do that with a series of filters and you're gonna step down rather than just have that one super fine filter. Uh, because if you do that, all you're gonna do is have it plugged all the time. Uh, once we come out of the, the air prep, we come through and we'll have some sort of a control device, a control valve, and that's going to control whether or not we have air pressure uh, going to one or multiple lines coming out of that valve. Uh, in this case, we're going to a, a cylinder that has air connected to both sides of it. And so this switch is actually uh, switching that air pressure from one side to the other side to give us the, the motion of it. And we'll see a little bit more of that in the following slides here. Uh, so when, one of the main things that we're looking at in pneumatics uh, are actuators. You know, these are what give us the actual work that we're trying to do. Uh, whether it's just a strictly linear type of operation, which most of these are, but we also have some rotary applications that we can do. Um, a couple of unique items here. We'll take a look at uh, one of these a little bit later. Uh, basically, a, a pneumatic muscle, if you will, and grippers. You know, so somehow, you know, we're not always just pushing something. Sometimes we need to actually grab it and pick it up to move it. Uh, so it, with actuators, we actually have uh, a couple of different types. Uh, one is a single acting one. And, and typically a single acting actuator is going to have some sort of spring in it. And so we have our air coming in at this far end. It pushes against this piston, uh, which gives us our motion out. And then uh, when we decide that we're done with that motion, we can clamp this to hold it or we can release it to air pressure and once that's released to free pressure free air pressure the spring overcomes that air pressure and pushes that that piston back uh, the amount of force that this can generate is dependent on this the area of this piston uh, so the larger the piston the more area that you're actually acting on that gives you more force uh, in some instances, we don't want it to be a spring return. We want to have it actually a powered return. Uh, maybe we're not only pushing something, but we need to pull it back as well. Uh, or if you have a, a heavy diverter gate, maybe it 
requires pressure to bring that gate back uh, when you're done using it. Uh, so in that case, we have air applied to both sides. And so it's powered both ways and then you exhaust to the other side. Uh, there are some applications where you can actually you know, power this part way and then pressurize both sides to kind of hold it in place. Um, that, that's a little tougher to do the multi uh, position type of things with pneumatics. Uh, there are some ways to do it, but they do typically get uh, a little more expensive to the point where you might be looking more at an electric actuator for something like that. Uh, but in this case, uh, you know, air on both ends gives us motion both ways. And so, you know, I, I kind of mentioned, you know, point to point motion is, is great for pneumatics, uh, but sometimes you have need for multiple locations. You know, like here where I said, maybe you can move it part way and hold it. Uh, a cleaner way to do it and, and usually less expensive is to actually use multiple uh, actuators. And the way we put these together gives us different ways to achieve the points that we want to get. Uh, in this instance, where we actually have the, uh, the rod of one inserted into the other one, but we can get three positions with two actuators. Uh, so in this first top instance, we have both of these are essentially powered. Uh, they're pressurized, so they're fully extended. Uh, that gives us our farthest, farthest out location. Uh, if we remove air pressure from this first one, uh, it will, you know, if we have a force out here, it will push that back in until it meets uh, our, our back actuator. And then if we move, remove the pressure from this back actuator and actually pressure uh, the other side of this front one, uh, we fully retract that in. Uh, so you see what we're using here is a one single acting and one double acting actuator in this case to give us that three position uh, control. Uh, and so you can, you know, over here, we kind of see that they're ganging multiple, you know, three. Uh, so you can gang multiples of these to get different uh, points of actuation. Uh, another way to do it is to mount two of them back to back. Uh, and that will actually give us, you know, a differing lengths. So we end up with uh, four different points that we can move to pretty easily just by which port we are actually in. And in this case, both of these are double acting. Uh, so they are able to be pressurized on both sides. Uh, we see here in this first position, uh, we are fully retracted on both cylinders. Uh, then we extend one cylinder to get that initial point. Uh, in this case, because we're using uh, different lengths of actuators, uh, we can retract that first one, and ex or the first one and extend the second one uh, that gives us that third point, and then we can fully extend both of them. Uh, so you see here we get that uh, four distinct locations that we can move to pretty easily. Uh, so we're not doing just linear motion all the time. If you remember certain things in the the video, you know, we did see some things turning. Uh, so we do have rotary types of application uh, and those are achieved in different ways. Uh, one of those is with a rack and pinion type of setup. Uh, this will give you a little bit of wobble, especially as the product ages and these gears tend to wear uh, like gears do, uh, but it gives you, you know, a, a specific rotation. And when we think of pneumatic rotation, uh, we're thinking probably zero to 270 degrees. We're not, we're not thinking something that spins continuously uh, or that moves in a full circle. Um, usually we do have some stopping points uh, and those can be uh, on a lot of these devices kind of manually adjusted, you know, so you, you kind of create those stopping points and you get that specific degree of rotation that you need. And you just need to pick a product that is capable of at least as much as you think you're going to want or maybe a little bit more. And we can put those stops in there. Uh, over here, we're actually using veins. Uh, and you notice in here, uh, two veins give you twice the torque. It's because you're acting on twice as much area, right? So you got more torque uh, with more veins. Uh, that, so you're coming into that chamber and you're pushing on those veins, kind of similar to the way we're pushing on the pistons uh, in this one. Uh, once we move things around, uh, sometimes we need to actually physically pick them up from, from one line and put them on another line, pick them up from a line, put them in a box, uh, different things like that. Uh, so we need some sort of gripper. And, and these operate in different ways. Uh, when you see parallel, you know, those things are moving out and back perfectly parallel. In a radial, you know, they, they have a pivot point and they, they move like that uh, and, and with different number of grippers on them. Uh, most of these devices, you look at them uh, with their 
metal arms that are moving, uh, these are made to have some sort of gripper material attached to them. And that's usually going to be very specific to whatever process you're doing. Uh, you know, we see these moving anything from uh, heavy metal objects all the way down to fruit. Uh, so with fruit, obviously, you need to be very delicate. So you're going to have some sort of rubberized gripper that's got some flex in it, but yet still has enough, maintains enough force to pick it up and move it from one place to another. Uh, so a lot of different applications that we're doing with these, uh, you know, very small changes in the length of that gripper finger can greatly uh, reduce or increase your force. You know, obviously the closer you are uh, to the pivot point, the more force you're going to have, and also the type of material that you're using uh, for that gripper. Uh, I'm not going to go into vacuum too much, but we did see, you know, in the video where we were using that for some pick and place. Uh, so vacuum has a lot of uh, uses within the pneumatic type system as well. Uh, it's probably uh, more specific to pick and place uh, rather than the actual motion of things uh, up and down a line, diverters, things like that. Uh, but we do have vacuum uh, objects that we can use as well, uh, whether it's a end of arm effector, something like this, or uh, different types of, you know, uh, lines of suction cups that will pick something up and move it. Uh, it is kind of amazing uh, when you look at some of the applications that vacuum technology is used in, uh, the types of surfaces that you don't think would uh, form a very good vacuum are actually uh, not as difficult as you think sometimes to pick those up, especially if we're looking at more of a Bernoulli principle versus a straight vacuum pump. Uh, so definitely, you know, keep it in mind as a, as a potential way to move something from one place to another is using vacuum technology. Uh, every, every application is a little bit different. So if you think it might be something, you know, definitely let us know and we can get uh, some of our friends over at Festo to look at the application with us and hopefully come up with a solution for you. Uh, most of what I have left here is just kind of, you know, some graphics of some different types of applications, you know, to help you see a little closer, uh, a little more, of a static picture rather than that moving line that we saw, just so we can kind of zero in on it. Uh, so here we're just using a couple of actuator arms to create some distance between product moving down a line, uh, maybe stop them for an inspection at this point here before it's let through. And it's just simple linear motion, right? In and, in and out. And depending on how heavy these items are, uh, you may, you know, more heavy item where you create more friction on that that divider arm, you're probably gonna use a double acting. Uh, if it's something that's fairly light, you might get by with a single acting and just rely on that spring return. Um, and a lot of these actuators, so, you know, we don't really get into it too much uh, in this, but a lot of these actuators actually do have sensors on them uh, that will tell you which position the arm is in. So you get that electrical feedback to your PLC systems as well. Uh, here, we're, we're simply using uh, diverter arm, you know, so you've got a conveyor, something's coming down the conveyor. When you decide you need to kick it off, uh, you just fire that, that actuator uh, with air pressure and it goes out and diverts it down into another line. Uh, clamping, you know, so we can apply force to something, hold it in place. Uh, so here we're kind of looking at that uh, in, in this application, but we come down here to a more complex machine. Uh, we probably have something here that's actually clamping a product. Uh, we have another actuator that's extending that product through an opening. Uh, so then we clamp it in place after, you know, a set length probably. And then we have another actuator going up and down, giving us that cutting uh, motion here to divide up that product as it, and then it lets it fall onto the conveyor. Uh, another one, you know, we've got a simple actuator going up and down here, uh, giving us perforations in a line, uh, maybe actually cutting something moving down a line. Uh, so there's just a lot of different ways that we can make the air pressure work for us. Uh, here's, here's another one. Uh, we've got a clamping one here in the middle, a couple of them. Uh, we've got a press over here. So a lot of people, when they think press, uh, first thing that comes to mind is hydraulic press. Uh, so hydraulic is actually, you know, typically an oil filled line. Uh, again, it's a fluid, right? So hydraulics and pneumatics are very similar. If you have experience in one, uh, there's a lot of stuff that kind of bleeds over into the other. Uh, just the fact that one, you're working with uh, an air, you know, a gaseous air, the other one you're working with an actual liquid. Uh, so you do have some differences in the types of uh, connections and hoses and things like that, but the concepts are very similar. You know, we're using that fluid 
uh, to apply force to do work for us. Uh, over here on the right hand side, I just you know threw in some pictures of some of these that are, are pretty common for a, a clamping or a press type of application. You know, they're usually a shorter, more squat type of uh, actuator. They typically will have a larger piston in them uh, to give you that clamping force that you need to hold something in place. Uh, you know, here where we're, we're holding something in place for a framing, you know, probably a glue drying type of application, or maybe it's got some press fit uh, pieces in there that we were pressing together. Uh, you know, same thing down here, you know, maybe we're gluing two boards together. Maybe we're just holding a board in place while the ends are being cut. Uh, just to keep it from moving. So uh, here we got you know a little more complex type of thing. Here we've got a saw application, uh, but we've got various amounts of motion in here. Uh, probably an electrical saw on this, but there, like I said, there are pneumatic motors available as well. And in fact, I was just talking to a customer uh, just last week about a pneumatic motor. Uh, so they are something that we can use. Uh, but in this case, just for the torque, we're probably using the electric. Uh, but you're just you know up and down motion here and then using that in and out motion so we bring it into place get that saw moving bring it down slide it across the material and we can you know with with these gantry systems you know we can get a fair amount of force to push that saw through a, a material over here again we're back to more of a vacuum type uh, picking and placing of something uh, but we're picking it up, but then we're using that linear action here uh, on the actuator. You know, so we've got a couple of motion, a couple of axes of motion here, uh, coupled with that vacuum on the end. Uh, so multiple, multiple pneumatic items working together to provide us the work that we need done. Uh, similarly, here we've got multiple motions again. You know, here we've got that up and down motion, uh, and then we've got that gripper. Uh, so, like I said, in this case, it looks like that gripper is being used without any uh, additional fingers on it, and it's going to depend on your application and the products that you're working with, whether or not you attach additional uh, end of fingers on those grippers or not. But we're just, you know, we've got that up and down motion, but we also got a rotary motion happening here, right? So uh, whether this is a rack and pinion or if this is a vein, uh, probably a rack and pinion in this type of application, and you're just providing that 90 degrees motion. Now, like I said, when we're talking rotary motion with pneumatics, uh, we're probably talking less, uh, 270, 270 degrees or less typically is what we're seeing uh, in that application for how we're using it. Same thing over here, we can see uh, we've got that gripper down at the bottom, uh, but this looks like that's one of those rack and pinion uh, devices here, so we can pick it up, rotate it, put it down, or uh, you know, with the actuator up here, uh, we can probably move it on a line or from one line to another and rotate it at the same time. So, like I said, a lot of different applications we can do them, not just our our, our uh, cylinder type actuators. Uh, you know, the actuators are the grippers, the clamps, the stopper cylinders. We didn't really talk about stopper cylinders, uh, but like a lot of times with a conveyor line or something where you've got motion, but you want to hold something in place. So we don't always do that with a diverter arm. Sometimes we just use a, a rod that comes up and blocks uh, you know, a cart or something or a box moving. Uh, these little guys are typically pretty squat, you know, pretty solid chunk of metal there uh, because they're taking abuse, right? Something is sliding down a line and hitting them and we're causing that, that motion to stop. Uh, so that is kind of an abusive uh, type of application. Uh, so these are usually a pretty heavy duty type of device. Uh, clamping can be done a number of ways. We kind of, you know, on the previous slides, we looked at some clamping where we were using the actual actuators, uh, but we have some, some more membrane style uh, clamps as well, where they basically just, you know, you fill that air membrane and it holds something in place because you've got the rubber uh, type of membrane. So it creates that friction to hold things there. Uh, the other thing here, you know, kind of an interesting statistic, 90% grippers uh, that we see from Festo are pneumatic, uh, but we do have electric uh, grippers there as well. And so you will see some applications where an electric gripper may be the right fit, but what we're focusing on today is the pneumatics and it's the larger portion of what we have available. 
uh, kind of alluded to this one earlier, a, a pneumatic muscle. Uh, so this is unique to Festo. Uh, basically, it's a, a rubber membrane uh, with some, uh, you know, high, high uh, pressurized capabilities, the material that's in it. And when you put air pressure to that, that tube expands, which in effect pulls the ends closer together. Uh, so it acts just like a muscle would. You know, as, as the muscle bunches up, the ends come closer. And you can get it, you know, in different diameters and, you know, pretty long, you know, 30 foot tube like that. Uh, you could develop a lot of forces in something that's that long and maybe 40 millimeters diameter. Uh, so incredibly powerful, uh, very unique type of product that can be used in a lot of different environments. Uh, great for harsh environments uh, because it's got that airtight seal. Uh, all the air coming in and out is going through our tubings or through you know our air tubes coming into this product. Uh, so it's not exhausted right at it into the atmosphere in the environment that we're working in. Uh, so like I said, this was this was quick and, and really easy. Uh, we did you know schedule plenty of time today because we wanted to you know if you guys have some questions after seeing this uh, because really this is more of a thought provoking uh, presentation. You know what what can I do with it? Uh, is it right for my application? Is it something I should be considering for my next machine? You know different things like that. Uh, kind of where we wanted this to to lead you. Uh, and so pros and cons of pneumatic versus electric, because a lot of us have got that electric background. Um, typically pneumatics are less expensive, uh, especially when you're looking at point to point motion where there's a lot, a lot of uh, fine tuning that we're gonna need to do, uh, less susceptible to vibrations, uh, better for hazardous or wash down areas. Obviously you don't have with the, with the air flowing in and out, uh, you don't have that spark for a hazardous location. So it's not something you need to worry about as much there. Um, for wash down areas, there are some other things, you know, we don't have the, uh, the electrical, you know, where we're going to short something, uh, but you do have to consider the types of wash down that you're doing uh, and how that's going to affect your, your rods on actuators, different things like that. Uh, obviously, uh, when you're using that air pressure to do work, you do have seals on all the devices. Uh, so different types of seals might be better for certain washdown areas. So we do want to look uh, at your application closely when we're selecting products to make sure we're getting the right type of uh, materials in that actuator that we're using. And also, you know, washdown hazardous areas, uh, because a lot of our control of the of the air pressure is coming through electrical someplace, you know, where do we place that actuator? You know, obviously we can place that that control valve that we looked at in that one slide uh, outside of that hazardous area and then run air tubing into our hazardous area to actually do the work. Uh, so a lot of things to kind of consider when we're laying out a new system, you know, where do we want to place the valves, uh, what types of materials do we need in our actuators, things like that. Um, kind of the, some of the cons when it comes to pneumatics versus electric, uh, like I mentioned, they, they are not as good for precision, precision control. You know, so if, if you need something with very precise control, uh, you might be looking at more of a servo motor type of application, uh, stepper motors, different things like that, and all things that we can help you with uh, here at e and as well. Uh, so it doesn't preclude us from, from helping you on those, but uh, definitely pneumatics might not be the right fit for that. Uh, they are making uh, amazing uh, strides in giving us more precision control in pneumatics, uh, but it does typically ramp up the price to try and get do that. And then but anytime you're putting together an air system, uh, leaks can be expensive over time. Uh, it's it's kind of amazing uh, when you start looking at some of the charts for, you know, if you've got a leak in your system, uh, how much that can affect your your bottom line over the course of a year, let's say. Uh, air, you know, you're actually using electricity typically to compress that air. So you've got costs associated with that air being pressurized. Uh, and so if you're just expelling that to free air, you know, to the free atmosphere after compressing it, obviously you're just wasting that, that money that you spent to compress it. So that, that's one of the big ones is air leaks. And, and there are ways, depending on your system, that we can monitor that and, and check for those a little bit and make sure that uh, we're not leaking that air out. So that 
that's kind of what I had for today. Uh, and like I said, this is really, today was meant more for thought provoking. Hey, where can I use this? What, what am I missing by not using it? Uh, maybe I've got air in a plant and I'm using it for some, some impact tools or something in the shop. Uh, but maybe there's places I can use it on my line. Uh, maybe it's a lot cheaper over time to use, use this than an electric actuator. Uh, so we want to get your minds thinking on these and open you up to some of the possibilities. Uh, and, you know, we'd love to come out and look at your different applications and, you know, help you design something new or, or improve something that's already existing. Uh, we do, I think, have a couple of the Festo guys on the line with us. Uh, like I said, I do not consider myself an expert, but if you guys have any questions and want to throw them in the chat, uh, I will definitely take a stab at it uh, more from a conceptual standpoint than actual products probably right now. Uh, if you've got specific product uh, application questions, uh, I would definitely ask you to reach out to myself or one of our account managers who may be calling on you already. And you know, we can talk in detail about those uh, and bring in the right resources. Like I said, uh, Festo has been great for us to work with. Uh, they've got some amazing resources up and down the entire West Coast here. I've worked with a number of them uh, and, and have been just blown away by the support that we've gotten in the last two years. Uh, so uh, I really, you know, for the guys from Festo on here, thank you for that. Uh, your resources are awesome. Uh, if you guys have not uh, looked into pneumatics, uh, the Festo website is a great place to go and kind of look at things. Uh, it's very uh feature rich as far as putting together a product and configuring it. Uh, it's very easy to get CAD drawings off of their website, uh, to get you know, specifications about the products off their website. Uh, so for those of us here, you know, we're all in the US, so it's just uh, www.festo.com slash US. Uh, keeps you in that US centric site. Uh, they are uh, uh, based you know, out of Germany. So they do have kind of an international offering. So we try and keep ourselves focused here, unless you're working on a machine that's going overseas, uh, then maybe we need to open up to look at some of those other products as well. Um, but with that, I, I definitely thank you guys for your time today. Uh, feel free to open your mic and ask questions or shoot some stuff in the, in the chat and definitely give us as much feedback as, as you can on those surveys when they come out, uh, because we want to, we want to grow this uh, we are looking at doing an actual in-person, uh, more of a three-hour three hour workshop type event. Uh, if, if you guys have been working with e &M for a long time, you've maybe seen some of our other workshop events. Uh, we're trying to put something like that together. Uh, on the pneumatic side, we are going to do our inaugural offering of that, uh, probably in Portland here in, uh, I believe, 10, uh, October 19th, I believe is the date we're shooting for, but you should see that on our- October 20th, uh, John, just so you have it. Uh, I, just, I was just talking to Will and said that the 20th does not work for me. Okay. So we are shooting for the we'll 19th. Let's see. I, I, Chris or Memo, do you, or if you guys are on the line, uh, you know, Tim has got any examples of applications where a pneumatic muscle have been used. Uh, I haven't seen those. Uh, I just uh, saw those and thought they were a neat product. So I threw them into the slide deck for today. If one of you guys are on there and have an example um, of where that would be a great product, I just, it, it seems very innovative to me. Yeah, it's, it's a product that's been around for a while. It is a very niche product. Um, you know, there, there are, uh, it, it works when it works. And then in some, in many applications, it doesn't. I mean, because of the fact that it is basically single acting, um, that, you know, there's one issue there. Um, and it, it shrinks to basically, or it reduces basically one third of its overall length. So, um, you know, if you've got longer runs, you, you have, you're only gonna be moving a third of that overall distance. So then kind of create some issues as well. Some of the unique benefits of it that I've seen is that you can bend it, right? I mean, you could wrap it around something if you needed to, you're not gonna get that from steel or any kind of rotted actuator like that you know, you might have it this, the only unique application I've actually seen it on is from Festo where they're actually using it to, to mimic a hand, right? And they've got it bent around some things and they can individually act each one and they kind of move like fingers and they're moving a hand around. I haven't seen any quote unquote real world applications that I'm familiar with, um, but it has been around for a significant amount of time and it is a pretty niche product. 
Yeah, I, I agree, Memo. It is cer certainly, um, I've never actually seen one in action right, other than in videos, but they, they also do use a tremendous amount of air to get them. So again, you're correct. It's definitely a very niche market or application. Is, is this one of the products that came into being uh, through the Festo Bionics program? It probably got its legs started there. Um, and I'm sure that it probably has, there probably is one application or, or several out that maybe are in Europe. Um, but like I said, I haven't, I haven't come across any um, other than, I, I take that back. I have seen it in one application where they were kind of using it uh, now that I'm recalling it for a vibratory feeder. And because of the fact that it doesn't really have any wear wearable parts so to speak they were kind of just using it with a um, fast acting valve and opening and closing it so quickly and it was kind of creating the vibration for the bowl yeah I, I like to mention that festo bionics if you guys are looking for for some really neat innovative product design and and kind of r d type projects festo has a, a bionics group and they basically, you know, every few years or so, they, they take something in nature and they try and mimic it. Uh, sometimes that's electric products. Sometimes it has pneumatic products in it. Uh, regardless of what products it has in it, uh, a lot of times those things create uh, a thought process and those things migrate from, and when I say bionics and they create something in nature, uh, they have a bird, uh, they've done a kangaroo, they, they've done, you know, just... Uh, I think they have some insects now that they've done recently, uh, some micro, some micro type of stuff. Um, yeah, if you get a fish. chance, yeah, Festo Web, uh, go onto YouTube and type in Festo Bionics, and you'll get to see a, a myriad of different things that uh, have been created. It's it's pretty impressive. Yes, very very cool stuff. Uh, trying to get to the chat, uh, we do have a question there. Uh, examples of how a pneumatic system is purged of air in an instance of hitting an e stop. Uh, that actually brings up an, an interesting thought process too. So uh, when we're thinking of air, uh, just like we do in electrical side, we've got to think of, okay, what's the safe state? Uh, is it to purge the air from the system or is it to maintain pressure on the system? You know, what's going to keep our machine in a safe state, right? Uh, but there are, there are uh, products that are made to do that uh, where they will uh, stop the pressure from moving downstream, uh, but also purge anything that is downstream back through that device. Uh, so that is something that you can put into a system at various locations in your system, depending on, on this, the layout and the safety requirements of your system. A lot of times you're going to see that uh, probably kind of in line with where some of your uh, last stage air prep is. Uh, you know, it, it a lot of times fits into those lineups. Uh, but we can use them standalone as well. So uh, there, there are definitely those products available that we can get for you. Yeah, John, those are our, our uh, soft start quick dump valves that are typically in line and they can be controlled remotely by your PLC so that if the downstream pressure does build up too much, it'll, it'll dump right back through the, um, through the unit itself at the air prep unit. All right, Memo and Chris, maybe you guys can help me with this one. Uh, one should air the air or, or liquid filters be changed when they're dirty <laughs> you know it, it really depends i mean some equipment goes to hot humid climates and some goes to very arid dry climates it depends on the customers uh, do they have dryers do they have uh, chillers at their compressors are there really long runs of of uh, piping to get to where they're at it's really specific to that uh, more than, than anything. But typically on a PM, if you have an auto drain, um, which has to be piped into a container because of OSHA laws, um, you know, those, are, those last a little longer because they, they automatically drain into a container. Um, but typically the elements themselves, you may want to service every six months. And if it's a manual drain, you know, they should be checked every month or less, depending again on how much uh, fluids and dirt and stuff you have in your lines. And I oh. think some of, don't some of your products and forgive, forgive my ignorance here again, I'm kind of new to them, but, uh, don't some of your products have kind of an indication on them too, as well for, for percentage dirty or, um, or using air pressure, 
um, sensors to kind of say, okay, my pressure is, is not flowing through this device as well as it should? Yeah, again, that would probably be in the, um, the soft start device and quick dump valve. And there are pressure sensors that are available that go in line as well with that unit. So it will sense. Uh, that's typically where there, where those would, you know, where you would see those. Does that answer your question or? Yeah, I think hopefully, uh, hopefully we covered some of what they're looking for with that. We got one comment in there about using products underwater, uh, thinking that pneumatics would be a better a better use than electric. Uh, certainly safer, right? Uh, you don't have the uh, uh, short circuit type of thoughts there, uh, you know, for saws or grinders. So, so basically, a pneumatic motor. Um, I, I don't know if that's anything that you guys have seen, Chris or Memo, but that's that's definitely an interesting thought. Yeah, I have not. I mean, but it is certainly safer than electric. Yeah, I have not either, but I would say they're probably uh, that that comment was probably directed more towards a fluid muscle. I mean, yeah, I'm sure if you had the fluid muscle on a long run, you could probably run it through water and it's not going to really create any any issues there um, with that material. I know that material can certainly withstand it, but I, I it, it'd be interesting to see an application of that nature. Uh, I got a question on how can we tell if the pressure is below what it is supposed to be? Uh, so yeah, there, there's you know various different ways. One is just a, a visual indicator, right? We can put a, a pressure gauge on the line, uh, and you're going to probably you know initially tune your system to a certain pressure. Uh, and a lot some of those gauges we can actually put uh, red and green on that are kind of uh, somewhat variable, uh, so that we can you know quickly look at a, a visual indication. Yes, we're in the green, so we're uh, at the pressure we want to be. Uh, and red might be on either side, right? It might be too low and too high. Uh, other applications, yes, we do have electrical sensors, uh, pressure sensors that will go back to a PLC. Uh, and certainly once you're doing that, you know, you can tie that into a SCADA system or whatever once you get to the PLC. Uh, so there are there are various different types and ways to do that, uh, depending on, on what your needs are and your accuracies and things like that. Any other questions today? Well, again, I certainly appreciate everyone's time. Uh, if you know you, you're thinking of something that you maybe don't want to present to to the chat or or through the mic today, uh, certainly feel free to uh, contact myself or any of my coworkers. Uh, we'll be happy to help and uh, get the right people involved to solve whatever problem you guys are are trying to overcome. Uh, it's been uh, a great having you all here. Uh, we had a fantastic turnout, so uh, thank you for your time today. And have a great day. Thank you very much.